I'm here with Wendy Samter from Bryant University to learn a little bit about her research. Thank you for taking time to chat with us. Pleasure. Uh, we'd like to start by having you share a little bit about what got you interested in interpersonal communication as a field of study and uh, what got you started here. Okay. I think, like so many people, uh, my senior year, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do as an undergrad. And um, somewhere late uh, first semester, my mentor wrote on an exam that you should go to graduate school. Um, and I thought I was really interested in mass communication, actually. So I applied to all the schools, and, and I got in, and I ultimately chose Purdue. Mm -hmm. And um, the first couple of weeks, I had a seminar with Brent Burleson in interpersonal communication. And after those first two weeks, I just knew that interpersonal was going to be my path. Um, it was completely different. I'd never been exposed to interpersonal. Um, and it just really resonated with me because um, he was doing work, his early work at the time, uh, in comforting and emotional support. And I had just lost my father. So it just kind of gelled that, yeah, I, this is how I want to spend my career studying this thing that seemed to have been helping me understand what I was going through and I just wanted to understand it more. Mm -hmm. So since then I've never looked back. So share a little bit with us about some of the key findings that you found in your research or that other people in the social support literature um, have found about how people communicate comfort and support to others. Okay. Um, I think you can identify four or five really important sort of phases of research. And I, I think the first phase was pretty early on, um, and Brant and I were working on sort of taking the relationship between um, the co social cognitive variables that we knew predicted um, the use of sophisticated, good, skillful, comforting messages from pen and paper sort of into the real world. So we did a series of experiments where we looked at people's levels of social cognitive ability, then came up with some quasi-experimental designs mm -hmm. where uh, people thought another was experiencing distress and we wanted to to capture their reaction. And we found that, yes, in fact, in the real world, that mm -hmm. pen and paper measure held that, in fact, complexity did predict the, the use of sophisticated messages in real world mm -hmm. settings. Okay. So that was a really important sort of breakthrough. And then I think another phase of research was, OK, so we have these great forms of messages. Um, do they actually? Do people actually think of them as alleviating distress and helping people through emotional hurt and disappointment? Mm -hmm. So there was a whole series of studies uh, looking at the, the perceptions of those messages. And indeed, we found that people did think they did a better job at, mm -hmm. at resolving uh, you know, hurt and disappointment. Right. And interestingly, that um, everybody felt that way. So even people who couldn't produce them, mm -hmm. right, because they didn't have the level of social cognitive right. ability, still appreciated right. um, them as doing a better job. Mm -hmm. um, then I think another really important thing came when uh, Susie and uh, Susie Jones and um, uh, Brandt and some of their colleagues actually did some work on um, how the what was the process of how these things were working right. so what were the internal mechanisms of what was going on and they and they integrated some really important literature from Lazarus and Penny Baker mm -hmm. and um, sort of developed a model of um, coping and why the messages were doing a better job and then I think there were some really important studies um, that followed trying to look at sort of other individual difference variables mm -hmm. that did and did not predict, interestingly, um, what would work. Mm -hmm. And um, if so for a long time, people thought sex was an important right. predictor. And in fact, it's not a very important right. predictor. Um, but things like um, uh, race seems to be a very important predictor of what people think uh -huh. works in uh -huh. comforting situations. Um, things like prayer and religiosity and huh. your own sort of spirituality seems mm -hmm. to be an important predictor. Okay. Um, and then I think the final thing is that... Um, it, Brandt and some of his colleagues towards the end of his life were working on um, some studies where they actually, people actually were exposed, people in need, not uh -huh. hypothetical right. scenarios, in, right? In real situations, in real situations right. were exposed to these messages and then asked um, 
how they felt afterwards, mm -hmm. and there was significant reduction okay. in the um, discomfort, the distress, okay. and that's a really important you know uh -huh. piece of information for us to know. So I think that's kind of the gamut of the research in mm -hmm. terms of the important phases that mm -hmm. we've been through. And where do you think it's going next? What do you think the next big question is? That's a good. That's a good question. Um, for me, I think that. We know a whole lot about the actual um, support process once it starts, right? right? right. Um, I don't think we know about how people ask for support. Mm -hmm. And there's there's some work on it and some very good work on it in um, social psych, but again, it's not a message emphasis, sure. you know? Right. So I think we really need to understand how um, people elicit support uh -huh. attempts, who they're eliciting support right. attempts from, and how that might vary um, as, a, as a function of the kind of problem you're having, right? Uh -huh. So we know that, you know, if you're to blame for a, a problem, mm -hmm. you don't get such great support, right? right? But you still may need the support, so how do you position it? How do you right. try and elicit it, even if you're to blame, and how does that differ sure. from situations where you've just kind of been smacked upside right. the head by something that's not your fault? Uh -huh. So I think support elicitation uh -huh. um, seeking uh -huh. is an important um, area that we're going to see. And, and I also think that, at least from my perspective, um, continuing to explore ethnicity and how that really impacts sure. perceptions of support. Um, and I'd also like to see, we know a lot about support now. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know everything. There's still those gaps to fill in. Mm -hmm. But there are so many lay people who engage in support, right? Mm -hmm. um, health professionals, right. you know, rabbis, praise, pra you know, all kinds of things that I really think we have enough of a body of evidence that we can take this to the public. And there's been some attempts to do that, right? right? right. But I think we need to get much more serious in terms of getting the message out there. Mm -hmm. um, because this stuff, you know, it not only improves people's um, emotional well-being, but it has long-term relational effects, of and course. it has yeah. health consequences, of right? Course. Yeah. Uh, people who can manage their distress and, in mm -hmm. better ways just don't suffer the health problems right. that others do. So I think it's important information to, to translate. So that's kind of where I see, I would like to see it go. I guess one other area is I'd really like to see, Erin and McGeorge is doing some wonderful stuff with advice. Mm -hmm. And it's always kind of on the fringes right. of the emotional, you know, and, and any real support encounter involves <laughs> emotional support and advice. Right. And I'd love to see that stuff beginning to get yeah. uh, integrated. The actual message and yeah. the content yeah. would be really interesting. Yeah. Good. Yeah. What advice do you have for undergraduate students who are majoring in communication and taking this course on interpersonal communication uh, in terms of taking what they're learning and applying it to their real life? Um, I think I have a couple of different pieces of advice, and one comes from what we've learned from our own alumni who have gone out to work and come back to report uh -huh. uh, what's important. We do an alumni panel every year at Bryant, and this year we had uh, 10 or 12 folks come back, and, and they really are in all walks of life. Um, some are managers, some are sports broadcasters, some are working for nonprofits, so it's really a gamut, and um, they all majored in little different emphases within okay. tracks within the discipline but in our program everybody has to take a certain number of interpersonal communication courses mm -hmm. and every single one of them said that those skills are crucial no matter what you're doing mm -hmm. so even if you are you know reporting on the Pawtucket Red Sox which is our team uh, minor <laughs> team that you still have to understand how to work with people right mm -hmm. or uh, if you're a manager you have to understand persuasion and how it operates in interpersonal context so um, I I think a lot of times we think of interpersonal uh, as intimate relationships, and of course it, mm -hmm. it deals with those things, but there are lessons that are really, really applicable um, to virtually any job you're in, and I would um, pay attention to those lessons because mm -hmm. those skills are important and not everybody has those skills. That's another thing. Employers report back that um, a lot of times the interpersonal skills are really missing mm -hmm. in uh, employees. Um, learning how to work with people, understanding how to make good group decisions, understanding um, uh, how to discuss things in a, in a way that's not 
potential, it, it discuss difficult things in a way that's not um, uh, potentially offensive or dysfunctional yeah. and so, so um, we face conflict and work, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the interpersonal skills are important. Mm -hmm. So that's one lesson. And from my own work um, on emotional support, um, you know, everybody knows things hurt us, you know, mm -hmm. we get hurt on a regular basis and sometimes those things are small hurts and sometimes those things are big hurts. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that our friends and our family and our spouses and our partners um, help us through those situations can do two things, right? Mm -hmm. One, they can make us feel better, mm -hmm. right? And they can strengthen the relationship mm -hmm. and by extension, um, improve our health, mm -hmm. right? Um, or they can make us feel worse, right. um, they can damage the relationship, mm -hmm. and they can damage our health. Right. And so emotional support is such a fundamental part of our lives that um, I think it's really important to learn the kinds of things that help people and the kinds of things that hurt people, mm -hmm. because it's something that we're going to face forever. Yeah, it's really useful information to have for yeah. students. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to meet with us and chat about your work. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Samter's research, you can read about it in Chapter 14 of your textbook.